Hello and welcome to the History Lord channel. You join me here and I'm in Bloomsbury. This is Cartwright Square and there's a couple of tennis courts here and it's a lovely Sunday morning. And uh, we're here today to do a video that we've been promising to do for, well, how long is it James? Years. A it's a good while, okay. is it? It's a couple of years we've been promising to do this. So here we are actually doing the video all about the wonderful, fantabulosa Kenneth Williams. Roll titles. Welcome to London. So Kenneth Williams was born Kenneth Charles Williams in Bingfield Street in King's Cross, which is about a mile or so north of where I'm sat at the moment. He's born on the 22nd of February, 1926. His father, Charles, or Charlie as everyone knew him, was an assistant manager to a barbers and hairdressers, and his mother, Louise, who everyone called Louis, also worked in the salon. At a very young age, it was uh, Kenny's family came to actually live here in Cromer Street and actually lived just here at number 14 Cromer House. He attended the Manchester Street School, which is just around the back in what's now called Argyle Street. And it was here, he wasn't very academic, shall we say, but he did like the English master and so therefore he paid attention in those classes. And it was here and the English master that introduced him to the stage for the first time. And at the age of seven, he actually played Princess Angelica in uh, The Rose and the Ring. And he also got his first review. And his first review was, Kenneth Williams, with his mincing step and comical demeanor as Princess Angelica, was a firm favorite with the audience, to whom his snobbish and pert vivacity made great appeal. There you go. Not a bad review to start with, really, is it? In 1935, Charlie was promoted to salon manager. And it meant that they got the flat above the shop as well. So this is where Kenny moved to in 1935. He also changed school around that time as well, and he went to the Lyle Stanley uh, Central Boys School in Camden, where he carried on his love for literature, English and German. After leaving school, he became an apprentice draftsman at Samford's Maps in Longacre in Covent Garden. But this was interrupted by the war, and he was actually evacuated to Bicester in Oxfordshire, where he spent time with a veterinary surgeon, a single veterinary surgeon. And it was here he gained a love for middle-class life. And as he said, he came back to London with an entirely different accent. In 1944, the 18-year-old Kenny got his call-up papers to join the army. And he came here, just around the corner from Marchmont Street. Uh, this is the old drill hall. And as it says up there, it was the 20th Middlesex Artist Rifle Volunteers. And it was here he came for his medical. And as Kenny said, in all of his naked glory, he stood there and the doctor proclaimed him to, well, I can't really proclaim you anything, so I'm going to send you to Harley Street to be further examined. He went to Harley Street, where he found out they had, that he had pernicious anemia and he was given the grade of B2. So therefore he was sent to Carlisle Castle for his basic training. And after six weeks of basic training, another medical officer declared him A1. You've passed six weeks, haven't you? Off you go. And that was it. He was sent to Ceylon, which is now modern day Sri Lanka, and he joined the Royal Engineers Survey Section. He was there for a year, and in 1945, he was assigned to the Combined Service Entertainment Unit. And it was here that he met not only the future director, John Schlesinger, but also his lifelong friend, Stanley Baxter. So after Kenny was demobbed in uh, 1947, he actually went back to Samford's in uh, Longacre, in Covent Garden, but his heart really wasn't in map making. So on advice of his lifelong friend, Stanley Baxter, he actually went on the stage first in repertory companies, and then he went on to the West End into plays and reviews. It's whilst he was in the West End in about 1954, he was discovered by a radio producer, BBC radio producer called Dennis Main Wilson, who just happened to be producing a radio programme called Hancock's Half Hour with the wonderful Tony Hancock. It was here that he uh, was engaged as an actor to play various characters. And it was also here he met two of his uh, future carry-on stars, Sid James and Hattie Jakes. It's also in this programme he gained one of his most famous catchphrases. No, do not messing about. Good evening. <laughs> Good 
What do you want? I'm your roommate. I oh, know you're not. Come on. Come on. Don't miss the bell. Uh, it was 1958. 58 was he was a jobbing actor still in the West End of London, appearing in lots of reviews. And it was here he was discovered by the Carry On team, and he starred in the first of the Carry On series, and that was Carry On Sergeant. It also starred uh, Bob Monkhouse, uh, Kenneth Connor, and uh, uh, in the title role, the sergeant was uh, William Hartnell, who was. Who was, it? Who was William Hartnell? Come on, you're he was the first Doctor Who. He was indeed the first Doctor Who in 1963, so 60 years this year for Doctor Who. We might do one of those as well, but I think probably be saturated, won't it? Yes? Yes? No, I think we should. Oh, right, OK. He, he likes Doctor Who, I you see. Like but never mind. It was also 1958 that uh, Kenny met and worked with Kenneth Horne for the first time in a, a, a radio programme called Beyond Our Ken. And that was the first time he was teamed up with another wonderful actor called Hugh Paddock. They went on to the subsequent uh, programme, the uh, sequel to it, which was called, called Round the Horn. And it was here that uh, Kenny and Hugh uh, had two characters thrust upon them that became absolute legends. Those characters were Julian and Sandy. So how would you describe Julian and Sandy? Mm. James, how would you describe them? Campus Christmas. <laughs> Campus Christmas. A good analogy. For those who don't know, I, just, I suggest Google them or go on YouTube. There's a few um, audio um, things on YouTube that you can have a look at. Uh, Jin and Sandy were two out-of-work actors. They were always out of work and Kenneth Horne was in imminently reasonable with them and every week they had a different adventure they'd either be working in a pet store they'd be cleaners or they'd be ballet dancers or they'd be working as lawyers etc etc there was always double entendre and they spoke polare which was a, a gay slang of the time so that people didn't know what they're actually talking about um, if people did know what they were talking about they wouldn't have been allowed on the radio that's all i'm going to say Google them, have a look for them. They are hilarious. What can I usefully add? <laughs> he has to get into the part, Mr. Horn. Like all the great actors, he has trouble getting into his part, yeah, don't I you, do. Jewel? I do. Oh, yes. it's true. All of them do. Even Sir yes. John Gingold has that trouble. <laughs> now, are you ready now, Jules? Just ready. He's ready. ready. He's ready. The Seven Ages of Omi. <clears throat> <laughs> all the world's a stage, and all the Omis and Palones merely players. <laughs> They have their exits and their entrances. That's true, Mr. Orne. We all, uh, we all have our exits and our entrances. Oh, every one of us. Yeah. Well, I know I do. Oh, yeah. After radio, uh, Kenneth Williams was given his own television show that was called International Cabaret. And that was on BBC, the, the new BBC Two at the time. Uh, a great success, uh, but his success as a actor and uh, compare was starting to wane a little bit because there was other acts and actors doing what he did. So he went on to the talk show circuits and he became the doyen of the talk shows. I didn't have, I suppose the Cockney background meant that there was a certain fluidity, a fluency with uh, phrases. My mother was always very you know, quick with the, the handy phrase. I remember a man saying to her once about <coughs> her television set, her television was a rather antique affair, and he said, you should get the new one, the new Echo model, beautiful, the Echo model, 15-inch television, lovely 15-inch console. And my mother said, yes, well, 15 inches should console anyone. <laughs> so, that sort of facility, if you like. You know, it's a facility, isn't it, with words? So Carry On Sergeant was his first of the Carry On films. That was a lifelong association. But apart from the Carry Ons and his radio work and his voiceovers for television commercials, um, he also did uh, a few children's programmes as well. And uh, two of the most famous children's programmes that he did was Jack and Ori the uh, storytelling program. Um, he was a guest on that on numerous occasions, I think about 30 or 40 occasions over the years. And uh, he also provided all of the voices for the wonderful animation, Willow the Wisp. Hello, Edna. I was just thinking about you. Ha! Huh. I trust you were thinking nice things. Now here, a brighter animal would have told a fib. No, Edna, not nice things, but it was very funny. I thought of you being hit in the face with a tomato. He was a very private man as well, and his private life was just that, private. But he did keep a diary from a very early age, and so we're lucky to have those. But only about 20% of those diaries have been published. They still live in the British Library, just up the road from here. 
Uh, but sadly, I still think that there's uh, two um, volumes, I think it's 64 and 1965, it might be 65 and 66, that are still um, not classified, but they're not allowed to be shown. They don't want to show it to people because uh, um, it, it has a few stories in there that may be a little bit too close to the mark for some people who are still alive or have families still alive. So we're not going to go into that, but uh, what I'm going to say is photocopies are available don't tell anyone. The diaries tell us that he was great friends with the gay playwright Joe Orton and his boyfriend Keith Halliwell and indeed they went on holiday together to Morocco and uh, Kenneth tells of his uh, happy times just being in Morocco for four or five weeks at a time. His diaries gave us an insight to his inner turmoil especially about being homosexual and uh, he did insist that from sort of his early 30s onwards he was celibate now you can read his diaries, the 20% that have been published, and uh, they are available in various bookshops. And they are quite a good read. can be quite amusing, quite acid in places, and, uh, well, downright sad as well. But that was Kenneth Williams' life. On the 14th of October, 1962, Charlie mistakenly drank carbon tetrachloride, which is a powerful cleaning agent. Um, Louis had kept it in uh, a medicine bottle, in a cough mixture bottle. And uh, yes, as I say, Charlie accidentally drank it. Kenny was informed and Kenny refused to go to the hospital to see him. Now, as you may have gathered, Kenny and his father didn't really get on. And uh, his father died the day after, on the 15th of October. And an hour after Kenny was told of his death, he was on stage in the West End. The coroner recorded an open verdict. Now, a few years later, Kenny tried to go to America, but he was denied a visa. And they found out that Scotland Yard actually had a file all about Charlie's death. And it was suggested that Kenny, or Louis, or both, had conspired to poison him. Well, it's not believed, but suspicion was always there. By now, Kenny was living in a flat just by Regent's Park and Baker Street, and Louis wasn't far away. And then around 1972, he moved to a flat in Osnaburr Street in Euston. I think it was Marlborough House he was living in. Louis had the flat opposite and, uh, well, they were happy there. But it was on the 15th of April, 1988, that Louis knocked on his door and no answer. So she got the commissioner to come up and they answered. They opened his door with a spare key and they found Kenny dead in his bed. The inquest said that he'd taken an overdose of barbiturates. Whether it was deliberate or not, we'll never know. But the coroner gave an open verdict. But Kenny's last entry in his diary the night before simply said, oh, what's the bloody point? Now, I'm reminded by a quote from an American comedian called Fred Allen. And uh, I've got it here, so I don't misquote it. But he said, what has the comedian to show for all the years of hard work and aggravation except the echo of forgotten laughter? Well, that's quite sad, isn't it? And Kenny's life was sad towards the end of his, of his years. But let's leave another word to Kenny himself. He told the story of the atheist who asked the question, what if life's a joke? And Kenny said, well, the answer has to come from the comedian himself. Well, if it is a joke... Let's make it a good one. Now, Kenneth Williams is one of the few people who's got four current plaques to his name in London. Uh, there, was, there was five, but one of them's been uh, eradicated now. But the four plaques are, there's one in Bingfield Street where he was born. Uh, that's the London Borough of Islington put that one up. Um, there's the one that we saw earlier in the film at number 57, Marchmont Street. And that was placed there by the Marchmont Society. There's a current one in, the, uh, in Farley Court, which is by Baker Street, which is where he lived up until about 1972, and that's placed there by English Heritage. And there's also one in the foyer of the new Diorama Theatre, which is just by Euston, and uh, that's to replace the one that, on his old flat that was demolished. Uh, and the one in, the, in uh, the diorama is placed there by the British Comedy Society. And the uh, one that they replaced was the one on Marlborough House in Osnaburgh Street. And that was placed there by the Dead Comic Society. Kenny's legacy does live on and he's influenced a number of comedians over the years since he's uh, departed. Um, one of which I believe that um, 
James actually interviewed on his podcast for Last Line Films. That was uh, Tom Allen, wasn't it, James? It was there we are. I'll tell you what, why don't we put at the end of this video, why don't we put a clip of your uh, podcast talking to Tom Allen about Kenneth Williams. How's that sound? There we are. Good stuff. Wonderful. Well, Kenneth Williams these days is more remembered for the Carry On films that he starred in, but he was more than that. He was not only an actor and a, a comic, he was a raconteur, he was a diarist, and sometimes he was a, well, a sad, lonely fellow. But to the public, he was always Kenneth Williams. And, well, what a legacy. Who else can say that they were Kenneth Williams? Well, he certainly does live on on celluloid and on radio. Thanks very much for joining us today. We do hope you enjoyed this uh, video that we've been promising for ages and we've now delivered to you at long last. If you want to see what we do outside these videos, please go to Last Line Films. That's James's channel, which is on YouTube and TikTok, his podcast as well, which you're going to hear at the end of this particular video. And if you want to see what I do, go to hitchlord.co.uk. Thanks for watching and we'll see you very soon. Take care. Well, I, yeah, I really loved him. And uh, as a kid, as a small kid, I really loved him. I think yeah. because you sort of pick up on that feeling different quite early on. And if somebody else represents that, then that's very powerful. And I think the way he sort of embraced it, you know, he lent into f feeling tortured, feeling sad, feeling kind of, I think at times he felt like a square peg in a round hole. He felt misunderstood. Um I think the way he lent into that was very, I related to that as a very small child, like five, six years old. Um, and, and I think because you don't, as a child, you sort of show the word like, everything's fine, everything's happy. It's a happy book about a happy person. Like, well, sometimes you don't feel that. And if you're feeling a lot of emotions, somebody who comes along and goes, yes, life is strange, isn't it? I think it, it, it was, um, it, I think that's, for me, that, that felt, I really related to, to him. Um, and I think he often isn't given the credit he deserves. Like a lot of, mm. uh, um, let's as they often described, camp comedians of yesteryear. I think they're not given credit for how strong, how subversive they were, how brave they were. I think they're often seen as like, oh, Frankie Howard doing up Pompeii is a load of like innuendos and eyebrow raises. But yes, it is, and I always found that very funny because again, yeah. it's intimating like a sort of a complex inner world that you can't talk about, but yet yeah, sort of with a wink and a nudge is going, yes, I feel that too. He's, he's going to go like, that's a bit rude, isn't it? But also going like, I don't know what's going on in the world. Life is weird. I feel strange. Um, are you like this? Please let me know. Um, and uh, that's the sense I get from it. But but I think, and you think like when Kenneth Williams was doing Round the Horn in the 1960s yeah. on, on the radio, that was being played into homes across the country. And that, if you listen back to a lot of it, it is outrageously rude. It is really um, rude. <laughs> it's really rude. And, and um, you know, Polari, which people are always obsessed with like Polari, but like Americans get obsessed with like Cockney rhyming slang. It's like, I think they were, I don't think that people spoke exclusively in Polari, um, but they did kind of, it was just sort of ways of saying something a bit rude um, and also kind of galvanizing a sense of community in a, in a group that's sort of ostracized. But they, um, like like in the vernacular, but um, but they were saying outrageous things to to people across the country, and they and I I, I think it's a, it's amazing that people appreciated it and loved it. I think that's so brilliant that you know people who didn't have access to you know, people who were straight um, grew to love that those stories and love those sketches and love those love those characters, Julian and Sandy. Yeah, because my because um, because my dad loves Round the Horn and and oh right, so that's how I'm you know sort of all familiar with it because he was playing me this stuff. Oh know, so, right, growing yeah. up because you know he he loved like Kenneth Williams is probably one of his sort of heroes of you know. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, the the fact that it works on those on those on those levels, you know. Well, I think a lot of um, straight people really identify with, um, I mean, it, it, a queer perspective. Is that? I don't think Kenneth Williams would describe himself as that. But um, the, you know, an outsider, and mm. I think somebody 
who openly says, oh, life is complicated, isn't it, sometimes? And sometimes, I, and, you know, we sort of really embraced the sense that he had this self-aggrandizing nature. And because um, everybody's self-aggrandizing, you wouldn't, like, people buy houses to self-aggrandize. They buy fancy cars to self-aggrandize. They, they go on fancy holidays so they can tell their friends about how brilliant they are. Everybody's doing what Kenneth Williams was doing with his kind of, like, plummy accent and, you know, playing these character, like, doctors in, in um, carry-on films who were always so superior. <laughs> had to be brought down a peck or two because that's that's what everybody does and i think if you make fun of that if you because if you've either done that yourself or you've been the victim of somebody else doing it and sort of felt like well shut up um then then i think you really relate you really connect with that and i think again it's those complexities of, of the human experience and how they're represented in well it's not just in 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 uh in queer storytelling or 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 or, or anybody who's it doesn't have to be about sexuality i suppose it's just if you represent yourself as an outsider and you do it honestly, then I think people will connect with that because everybody's an outsider one way or another.